and uh, we can't thank you all enough for being here today. We, uh, we really are very excited about this series and uh, we're very excited about hosting our guest speaker today. Uh, but with that, um, we're gonna go ahead, but let me just make one quick logistical, logistical comment. And that is we were debating between doing this in, in traditional Zoom, which is what we're in or Zoom webinar. Um, but to make this most effective, you may want to consider moving into your speaker view um, at uh, when, when Jim is speaking or when our moderator, Demond Edwards, is speaking or Tina, for that matter. So just give that a consideration. Otherwise, we'll be seeing everybody here in the room or in multiple screens. So with that, we're going to go ahead and turn the program over to our esteemed chair, uh, Chair Tina Young with MarketWave, and uh, Tina was going to um, basically give us a context for what we're attempting to do with this series. So, Tina? All right. Thanks, Ken. Welcome, everybody. It's really good to see such a big crowd for this program and just kicking off this series. Um, I would like to start by setting kind of the foundation and, like Ken said, the context for this series which begins today, but it's gonna be a bi-monthly uh, program that we offer here at the North Dallas Chamber. Our next one will be in August. So let me just take a few minutes to set the stage and then I'll move into introducing our moderator and our speaker and we'll uh, run away with the topic today. So uh, everyone remember 2020? <laughs> Along with the challenges of a global pandemic um, last year, the George Floyd murder and subsequent racial reckoning in our country resulted in many courageous and sometimes uncomfortable conversations in our social and business circles. Many of us grappled with where we sit as a society and a business community on issues of race and racism. And we found ourselves wondering how much progress have we really made since the civil rights movement. Many of you as business leaders were moved to re-examine your company's diversity, equity, and inclusion practices. And you set new goals for progress and for improvement while engaging employees and key leaders. Well, I'm proud to say that this North Dallas Chamber did just that as well. And with the guidance of a committed um, group of chamber members and leaders on our board, we formed a DEI task force last summer, and it was led by our chair elect Dev Rostogi from AECOM. Wave at us, Dave, Dev. And thank you for your leadership in that, Dev, because that task force was charged with looking in the mirror on where our chamber sat with regard to DEI and identifying new opportunities uh, to improve, you know, and to just further this conversation. I'll tell you the good news is that we found we've made really good progress on diversity of our board at this chamber. And at the same time, we can do better. We also found that we've consistently advocated for economic infrastructure and healthcare equity and inclusion, but we can do better. So the bottom line is that last year put a refocused and clear lens on DEI for this chamber and our membership. And we're excited about the possibilities that that has brought to light. So today we are launching the Experiencing DEI series. It was a significant outcome of our task force work and launching it today really fulfills a personal goal that I've had as chair of your chamber this year. Personally, as a woman business owner, I know what it's like to advocate for greater diversity and inclusion in business circles. And as an employer, I know the power of DEI in building a great team, innovating and serving diverse clients. So I hope you'll continue to prioritize this series, be looking for the promotional materials we send out later and, and mark the next dates on your calendar. The word experiencing is really intentional in the title of this series. 
We want this program to be experiential, interactive, informational, and frankly, transformational in your own journey of considering DEI in your business and professional life. But now without further ado, I want to introduce our moderator and our speaker, and I want to dive into this great topic for today. So first off, I'm gonna introduce Dumond Edwards. You can wave Dumond. Um, he is the Executive Director of Community Development for West Coast University, and he's on our chamber board. He likes to say that education is a game changer, and it's a game changer for personal growth and career success. And in his role, he oversees campus operations, community connections, and student population growth at West Coast. He holds an MBA and an undergrad in communication, and he's going to facilitate our discussion today with Jim. Thank you so much for being here, Demond. Next, Jim, you're up. Our speaker today, Jim Schutz. He's an accomplished author and journalist, as many of you know from reading his work over the years. He spent 13 years with the former Dallas Times Herald. I am just old enough to know that paper and, and have read it um, and miss it. 22 years as a columnist for the Dallas Observer and most recently a columnist for D Magazine. In addition, he has written six nonfiction books, including the one we'll be talking about today with him titled The Accommodation the politics of race in an American city. Jim is a recipient of the National Association of Black Journalists Award for Commentary, the Association of Alternative News Weekly's National Award for Best Commentary, and a multiple winner of writing awards from Lincoln University's Unity Awards Program that recognizes writing on civil rights and racial issues. Finally, in 2011, I wanted to point out that Jim was honored to be admitted to the Texas Institute of Letters in recognition of a stellar career as a journalist and an author. We are honored and pleased to have Jim with us today. Welcome, Jim. Good to be here. So, Demond, I'm going to give you the floor and you and Jim can take it away now. Thank you, Tina. And thanks to everyone for joining the session today. As Tina noted earlier, this is the first of many uh, sessions throughout the next uh, couple of months. So thank you all for joining today. But it's obvious that we are all concerned about diversity, equity, and inclusion. In the absence of info, we tend to leap to the worst scenario. So we thought this session would be helpful to us all to achieve clarity of what's known versus what's speculated. So in this important topic that is affecting many of our businesses, as the moderator, I'll guide you through this session today. I ask that you freely provide your comments and questions in the chat box as we will periodically take questions and integrate into the today's session. We have a short period of time. So with that being said, let's dive right into it and talk, ask Jim the first question. Jim, how are you doing today? I'm good, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for joining us again. And, and Tina did an excellent job summarizing a magnificent background of yours. but. I think it's fitting we kind of start out for the audience. Could, could you talk a little bit or summarize your book for us, uh, The Accommodation, and, and, and kind of give the audience a high level overview of that before we dive into some more details? Sure. The first thing to say is that it was written a long time ago. It was published in 1986. I'm kind of looking at my new Zoom backdrop, and it looks to me like I'm speaking to you from the afterlife, uh, which is not, not true. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's what the afterlife is going to look like for me. The jury may still be out. Uh, but this is an old book, and a, a book that was, uh, as I say, published a third of a century ago. It explored the city's racial past, uh, racial history, racial politics. And it had a, you know, it had a certain life when it came out. Uh, uh, I spoke to people all over the city about it. And then it was the way old books tend to be. It was forgotten. It's now being republished, which is not a thing that I sought. Uh, 
there was some confusion about the rights to the book. I didn't even think I still owned rights to the book, but it turns out I do. It's being brought back out next September by Deep Vellum Publishing, which is a wonderful, smart, small, independent publisher in Dallas. And uh, I guess that's the curious thing about it. Why, why, would, why would anybody want to go back and dredge up a book from that long ago? I'm why still waiting to find out. <laughs> Again, I, I well, guess you have any insight on that. About 15 years ago, uh, I started getting invited to speak to groups about it, and they were all young people who had, were moving into the city, some African-American and Hispanic, but mostly white young people who had were kind of part of the whole back to the cities movement that we've seen nationally. Uh, a lot of them are sort of, I call them refugees from the suburbs. They grew up out there and now they want to be in the city. And uh, I was curious about why they cared about the book. I found that, that these are really curious, smart young people who grew up in pretty diverse settings out in the suburbs. And they grew up with an education, both in high school and college, that told them that civil rights was history. It was all over. It's all taken care of in the past. And then they've come into the city and they find this picture that doesn't jibe with what they were taught. They find this border across the middle of the city, north and south, and crossing that border, they tell me, is like going into another country. And uh, since then, they've had time, and the city has had time, to do a lot more concerted research on the differences north and south and racially. And so they're looking at that, and they are wondering, just, they're kind of saying, so tell us the story. How, how, why is it like this? And they found uh, my book to tell the story. You got it. So, and looking at your book, so many of the guests may not know this or may know this. Um, it is a Dallas treasure, but, you know, talk to us about the story of the shortage of copies. And, and you know, it, it's been this myth of how to find your book. I've heard about the topic. I can't find it. Where is it at? Give us some insight on that, please, Jim. The book was, was uh, suppressed when it was going to come out. It was going to be published by a local publisher. And I can't tell this story anymore without, without a caveat, because the story when it happened involved the Dallas Citizens Council. They had a lot to do with seeing that it would not be published at the time. The Dallas Citizens Council of today is unrecognizable from what it was back then. I don't think I can even say the words Dallas Citizens Council without pausing to say that the Citizens Council of today is not the Citizens Council of 1986, as this is not the Dallas of 1986. But the book was killed at the last moment when it was on the presses here. There was a small publisher in New York. The New York Times did a story about it being suppressed. And so this publisher in New York saw it. He published the book and shipped, he printed 5,000 copies and shipped them down here. Uh, about half of them sold. The other half uh, were burned up in a, a warehouse fire. So I like to say it was an instant rare book, <laughs> but there just weren't a lot of copies of it in the first place. You got it, got it. So and thank you for that, Jim. You know, well, well, talk to us, I mean, at that time, 1986, 87, what motivated you or what led you to, to write this book? And what were your hopes from your readers at that time to take away from this book? I got together with a young uh, editor at Taylor Publishing, a guy named Bobby Frazee. We were both in our 30s. He grew up in Birmingham, but he's also white. But we, he grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. I came from Detroit. We agreed that our two cities, Detroit and Birmingham, had very different histories, civil rights wise. But we also agreed that Dallas seemed anomalous. And we sort of tested it by asking other people we knew. Well, there were, there was a, you know, that was the time of the Sun Belt phenomenon, the huge migration of people here. So we asked other people who were new to the city, how does this place feel to you? 
And everybody said, weird. And the story that one got from the uh, white establishment at the time was that this city either had no history or had no racial history, that everything here had always been great and there had never been a problem. And, and that was because black people uh, liked it the way it was. They liked it divided and they liked the uh, economic differences. They were happy with that. So both Bobby and I agreed that that could not be true. That, that didn't add up. And so I spent a couple of years uh, looking both through original sources, uh, Library of Congress records of the Freedmen's Bureau, but also uh, microfilm copies of newspapers uh, from the 1950s in the city. And what we found was not, not that Dallas had a horrible racial history worse than everybody else in the world. Really what I found was that Dallas had the same racial history that everybody else had. It works the same way everywhere. And black people here had never accepted apartheid or second class citizenship. And there had been chapters of, of scary real violence in the city. Uh, there are some other ways in which Dallas was different. Dallas managed, depending on who you talk to, either Dallas managed to sidestep the, the turmoil of the 1960s and 70s, or the civil rights movement sidestepped Dallas. There are two stories, but it is true that Dallas did not have a lot of the turmoil that we saw uh, both in the South, in the, in the civil rights uh, march cities and in the Northeast and the, where there were uprisings. Dallas missed all of that. You got it, thank you, thank you, Jim. You know, and you hit on some points there about a lot of historical information there. And you really do a good job in your book of getting into like a lot of the facts and the history pieces that is not readily available. How do you feel that that impacted the community of awareness perspective in transforming Dallas into the direction that is going now? This is an embarrassing question because I don't believe <clears throat> until recently, I can't argue that my book had a huge effect. I spoke to every African-American church and political group in the city, and they were all very nice. And they said, we saw all this publicity about your book. It was suppressed. and Now it's out. And we were really expecting the bomb here. And frankly, Mr. Sheets, all the stuff in your book, we knew all that already. I mean, that history was well known in the Black community. The book simply was not read in the white community much. My mother read it, but I, I didn't run into a lot of other white people who did. Uh, W.A. Criswell, who was the pastor of First Baptist Church, went on National Baptist Radio and said that the book was pornography and that good Baptists would not read it. And there was a lot of it. It was very hard to find anywhere. It took me some pushing and shoving to get it into the public library. So I don't think in the first iteration, you know, the book, the importance was what the book told white people. The book was trying to say, you don't have the picture of the history here and you need to have the picture to know why things are the way they are. And I don't think the book effectively got that across because I don't think anybody white read it. Uh, now you have this very totally upside down, different phenomenon taking place where it's mainly young white people who are bringing the book back. Got it, got it. Jim. And Jim, you touched on a point briefly there that kind of led right into my next question for you. You know, what was your experience after writing this book with, you know, underprivileged communities? You know, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, as I say, uh, everybody was very nice to me. <laughs> I got invited out a lot. Uh, those communities, for the most part, said that they, they already knew most of what I said in the book. 
I did have a, a bump in real friction with the ministerial, the clergy community, because the book kind of singles out uh, the black clergy of the 50s as coming, as coming to this accommodation with white leadership that effectively sidestepped the turmoil of the 60s and 70s, but also sidestepped a lot of progress. And the, the ministerial leadership didn't, didn't like my book. And uh, we had interesting debates. Mo most of them were useful. And uh, I learned stuff that I didn't know. Uh, you know, the book does come from a, a white man's perspective. And uh, in, in that friction with the ministers, I just got a lot of perspective that I, I didn't have and that I wish I'd had before I wrote the book, although it wasn't all productive. I mean, uh, I, I ran into some serious hostility uh, from Black leadership on, you know, we say Black leadership, which leadership are we talking about? There was a whole new Black leadership in the city uh, for whom uh, now Dallas County Commissioner John Wiley Price was certainly a spokesperson. He liked, he, done, he didn't just like the book, he helped me write the book. Uh, he liked what I was saying, but you had that real division in leadership in the Black community and one side was happy with the book and the other side not so happy. And all the white leadership hated it. Well, 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 no, thank you for that, John. Yeah. So, since publishing the book, The Accommodation, you know, how did that impact, you know, your future writing topics or, or choices of topic, if you will? Well, uh, it, it caused me always to have this, no matter what the story, uh, this focus on the difference between North and South. Um, I did, I, I was a local columnist, but I was still working for the, what you call the city desk, which is sort of breaking news stuff. And most of the time uh, when I got sent to Southern Dallas, it was because something bad had happened, some shootout, a fire or something that I was gonna write about. And, uh, in those experiences, I would seem like I would always find myself standing out in a vacant lot somewhere, trying to get people who had seen it to give me quotes. And in those crowds, there might be a couple bad actors, but there was always, you know, the guy who should have been an attorney, the guy who should have been a teacher, the guy who should have been a CEO. Uh, there was just this huge sense of people who were not imprisoned, they were out prisoned. So that that, that combination of the, the segregation between North and South, the penal system, the, the way the law was enforced, the fact that if a, some, if a, I saw a quote uh, in the paper a couple of weeks ago uh, by Peter Brodsky, the developer saying that if a white kid messes up, his family, his parents, his community are going to give him a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. In my house, I think we could count up to 10 on chances. It, that if a black kid messes up in kindergarten, he's shunted into the disciplinary system. He doesn't get any second chances. And I think because of my work on the book, I always had that in the back of my head when I went out on whatever story it was. Every time out, I had this enormous sense of the difference between the two halves of the city and also the horrible waste of human potential. Uh, think what we could be doing if all these guys standing around this barrel fire, unemployed and unemployable, were doing what I'm doing, what you're doing, we're, we're in, the, in the mainstream. And so I, I think because I worked on this book fairly early in my time here, I've always had that orientation. Yeah, great, great, great. You know, I want to pause for a second. I think, you know, uh, we have a good question, you know, and the question is, you know, in terms of race relations or the North-South divide in the last decade in Dallas, 
Was there a point where we move past the accommodation or are we still trying to get past it? You know, we've moved past it in so many ways that uh, if you, if I could time machine back to myself back to 1986 and you told me that the chairman of the board of the <laughs> Citizens Council was an African-American man who was also CEO of a Fortune 500 company. If you told me that the CEO of the Citizens Council was an African-American, if you told me about the progress we've made, I flat wouldn't have believed it. On the other hand, we're still stuck with these terrible discrepancies. I'm just, I'm looking down at a, a page that comes from a JP Morgan report that shows that, uh, of 25 to 34 year olds, uh, the, the ones who, are, who have gainful good employment, good jobs, it's nine in 20 of white people in that age group, it's three in 20 of Hispanics, it's three in 20 of black people. So these, we can get fooled. You can move around downtown, you can move around the suburbs, you can move around a lot of places and say, well, it's over. You know, it's solved, it's resolved. Look at my church, look at my neighborhood. We've done it. But you drive across that, that equator between the two halves of the city and you see that it's not resolved at all there. There's an enormous left behind population where it's not resolved. And, you know, children are born into that world. Yeah. Children who didn't do anything, to, who didn't get to choose at all. And so we've made enormous progress. And I like to tell people, uh, I tell this to my son just to get on his nerves. I, I, I like to point out that if we look back to the time when I wrote the book and we look to now, the progress is, is, is dramatic and the arrow is pointing to the good. So don't tell me nothing's changed. That's an excuse to do nothing. The arrow is pointing to the good and we need to keep it going that way. But if we look at the situation on the ground still in the difference between Southern and Northern Dallas, man, do we ever have work to do. Good, good, good. And you kind of mentioned a little bit, you know, a lot has changed you know, if I followed you correctly. Yes. You know, why is it still important work today for, from a DEI perspective? Why is it so important today that we still focus so much on this? And what are some of the things that business leaders can do to ensure that all stakeholders feel included? I, I have to tell a, a newspaper story here. I, I worked at a daily newspaper where we were gonna have this huge project. This was in Detroit. What do black people want? And there were like 10 people in the room. We had five meetings, all we we're going to have teams. And then somebody said, maybe we should go bring one of the black reporters into the group, see what they say. So they said, no, oh, okay. So we brought in Susan Watson, who was African-American, <laughs> very smart. And they, we explained the whole project to her. What do black people want? We're going to have these teams. We're going to go out in the city. And she said, oh, you don't need teams. You don't need to do eight stories. You can actually do that in one sentence. Everything you got, it's not, it's not complicated. And she said, what you are doing with your question is projecting a sense of difference that isn't there. Don't start out thinking you're on safari or something. Uh, don't assume this difference. Assume that we are all the same and then think how we can work it out. So there's an instance where our business, the newspaper business was about to be really stupid and look stupid to our own audience. And by just that little drop of diversity at the last minute, we, we were saved by it. So my argument would be that diversity makes us all smarter, makes us more able to see markets, to see the people we're trying to talk to or sell to, to understand them. And then the other thing, I'll go back to my thing about the people standing around the barrel fire. 
think how much it costs everybody, the businesses, to pay people to chase other people up and down the street, nab them, lock them up, and then pay somebody to tell them when they can take a shower for the next six years. Think if you weren't spending that money on that and then transpose those people into the productive world where they're making money for you and you've, you've flipped this huge economic equation around uh, from cost to profit. So I think that diversion, the diversity when it works is good for everybody. And um, Jim, uh, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, sure. And great perspective too, love the story. Uh, I just want to take a moment to remind our listeners, you know, feel free to throw your questions into the chat box. Uh, and like I say, we will periodically get to those. Uh, but Jim, uh, great information. Want to stick with this. And I, I want to kind of go back to your book a little bit, if you don't mind. You know, right. Being that we're 30 plus years later, you know, what lessons can we glean from your book that will, you know, be particularly appropriate for a business audience, you know, more than 30 years later? Well, one is that it, it's a big mistake to be afraid of the history that, you know, is kind of like putting off problems in your life. <laughs> the problem is always worse when it's hanging out there and you know you got to do something and you're not doing it. At least that's been my experience. So doing something about it is easier and feels better. And part of doing something about it is knowing the history. And when you know the history, and all kinds of work has been done recently that's way more definitive than my book. Uh, the city has done it. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase has done a big study. The school district has done a great work to show that these differences, north and south, are not accidental, that there was very intentional government policy you can take. The DISD has done this where you take the maps that were published in the 30s and 40s that said no house mortgages here, no small business loans here, those all go there. You can superimpose those maps on the map of the city now and they are, you see all the poverty and yes, the crime and the trouble and the disruption. And so you, so by looking at that stuff and seeing that, okay, this wasn't an accident, this was done, this was deliberate. Then you realize if we did it, we can undo it. You know, this isn't nature looking at us. This is stuff, this is policy. And it was bad policy when we did it and we can undo it with good policy. So I, th I think that that the lesson of, of the book and the lesson of the work that's been done more recently is that we do this stuff not to go around and beat up on white people and make white people feel bad. Everybody gets that there's, there's a limited future in that. <laughs> you know? uh, we do this stuff in order to be smarter and more analytical and to see how we get out of this and how, how we resolve it. Thank you, thank you. You know, based on your experience, you know, with the book, is there anything that you would remove or, or put a more of an emphasis on if you were to go back to the book today? Oh, a bunch of things. Uh, in fact, the republishing of the book has been an interesting experiment. We got, experience, I should say. We, we, the publishing of the book got hurried up. My, my publishing of it originally was hurried up because we knew there was going to be this effort to kill it. So some of it was done a bit hastily. And so I get calls from uh, the editor at the new publisher at Deep Vellum, who's bringing it out again in September, saying, Jim, uh, I'm a little embarrassed to bring this up, but there, we're coming across some mistakes in your book. <laughs> And I have to say, oh, I'm sure you are. And uh, so I've been working with them just to clear up small factual errors. There are bigger things missing there. People I left out. Uh, I didn't look broadly enough in the community. 
I think that there were more white people on the right side of this stuff than I saw. People associated especially with uh, white churches. Uh, and, and that's something that really rubbed wrong, raw when, when the book came out. The book has in it a whole description of a series of bombings of black families that took place in the 50s. There was a grand jury investigation that found evidence that the bombings were organized by white church groups in Southern Dallas. And I account, and I, I account all of that from the legal record and the journalistic record of the time. So it kind of looks like white church people were the villains. What's missing there is that there were a lot of white church people on the other side. You know, there were people of conscience and people who knew this stuff was terrible. And uh, that has a lot to do with why it ended. So if I could do it again, which I'm not going to do, uh, it would have some balance in it that it lacks. Yeah, got it. Thank you. No, thank you for that. Sure. Thank you. You know, uh, and I think, you know, we had a question come in, so I'll come back to the questions here in a second, you know, but I, I would like to, you know, ask you, you know, how can we help this group that's, you know, the business leaders that's on this call today, uh, make the Dallas community a better place moving forward from a DEI uh, in all inclusive perspective? You know, it's so tough because uh, whenever I have to make a decision that involves my own money, and uh, I don't have a huge number of those, but when I have to do it, I always want, instead of doing some big analysis, I always looking for somebody I know and I trust. And I, I just think that's instinctually how we do so much of our personal business and our business business. But if we only look into the circles we know and we trust, then in this world, in this time, in spite of all the progress that's been made, we wind up looking a lot at people who look like us, ourselves. So you have 10 candidates. And when you begin to think of the disparity of opportunity and what I was saying before about first chances, second chances, let's say you got uh, three women who went to this top uh, business school in uh, the Northeast and they have all these credentials. And then you've got three women who come from a less well-known closer by state school. And the ones from the top school are all white and the ones from the state school are black. It takes a little reach to say, all right, I'm not gonna do this just based on what I always do, which is the people I kind of know and the people who come from the schools I kind of know, I'm gonna stretch myself to I'm not saying hire them because they come from the uh, other schools that look at them and talk to them and listen a little bit and realize that it's, I hate to say it, but it's easier for the white kid to get to that top school in the Northeast than the black student. So you have to do this balancing in your own head. And I'm not talking about giving jobs away or giving breaks away. I'm just talking about redoing the balance so that you look more closely and you listen a little more closely because maybe somebody over here on the left side of the picture from the state school is actually more who you want. I know, I hope that doesn't sound preachy or sappy, but I really believe it's this stretch that we have to do that makes the difference. Got it. Got it. Thank you. You know, in a moment, I'm going to have a pass over for a few questions from our audience here, but I, I think it's one question, you know, I think it's the elephant in the room, and Jim, you and I spoke about this, but when you look at it and you're going into minority communities, you know, why is it that you, the opposite of them, you're the person uh, for DEI, the spokesperson for DEI, and you're the opposite race of them? So talk to us you're, a little bit about that. You're putting this way more kindly than I told you <laughs> I get the question. And the question always comes up and it, it's usually not expressed angrily or as an insult. Uh, 
I got it recently from a bunch of wonderful students at the Tag Magnet High School. And the question is, excuse me, but why is an old white man talking to us about this? And that's a great question. And uh, I don't say what's on the, what I wanna say, which is I got no idea. Uh, I, that's not a good answer. Um, my answer is, it has some to do with the anomaly of this book being republished. And that's how come I'm old. It was written a long time ago, but it also has to do with the fact that that's a good question. There is a need for a new book. This needs to be brought up to date. Will Evans, who's the publisher at Deep Ellum, Vellum Publishing, has this concept in, in mind that we need to understand these issues locally, not just nationally. We need to understand them in our own community. And what he has in mind is really a series of books of which mine is only the first. And the next one's not going to be by a guy who looks like me. It will be by someone younger. I suspect it will be by someone who's not white, uh, not because Will Evans is trying to balance, you know, check boxes or something, but because he, the, the question of perspective again, trying to expand the perspective. And so the next book won't be by somebody who looks like me. The other thing that uh, I wanted to go back and tell the Tag Magnet kids, and because I didn't because I thought of it later, is that if what you are expressing is an impatience, that's good. That's what you should feel. And I do sense that in younger people, that there's a point at which they think, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we're sick of this. This doesn't make sense to us. Why is this? Why is it like this? And I think that's a very healthy uh, feeling to have about the whole issue. Great, great. No, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I want to take a moment. I think, Ken, we have a question. If I, I can call you out for a second, Ken Malcolmson, can I call you? I think you had a question here that I may have passed up in the chat box. Well, yeah, actually, uh, thanks, Jim, for being here. And Damon, thank you for moderating this session. One of the questions I have in the chat is that, um, you know, if we look at this at a more macro level relative to inclusivity, Jim, what are, what are some of the parallels that you can make between what you wrote about in the accommodation to the other communities of color or uh, communities of that may be considered minority, like the Hispanic community, which by the way is now 43% of Dallas County, uh, the Asian community, the LGBTQ community. When we look at this more inclusive, I mean, more macro-like, what, what, how can you draw parallels from, from your experience with the accommodation? One of the first things I should say, Ken, is that one of the glaring uh, uh, inadequacies of the book is that it did not look closely at the Hispanic experience. And as you say, this is uh, increasingly a, soon to be a Hispanic majority city. There are very significant differences between the Hispanic experience and the African-American experience and the Asian experience. It's sort of, a, in a funny way, a white assumption that those experiences would be the same. I mean, why would they? Uh, the African-American experience is very powerfully influenced by chattel slavery, Jim Crow, and institutional bias on, on a straight line, you know, segregation straight line back. The Hispanic experience is more of an immigrant uh, story, but it, it does have this element of, of color consciousness that we white folks bring to it. And then as we've learned in the last year, Asians have simply been uh, less, uh, less eager to talk about it, but when they talk about it, man, their experiences sound like everybody else's experiences with bigotry. And the lesson is that it's finding that, that principle that is the same in all these things. It's the same for the LGBTQ people. It's the same for everybody. It's someone at the middle of it saying, you're not a human being. I am, I'm the full-fledged human 
and you're not. And that's the same everywhere. That works the same against everybody who's the victim of it. Uh, and uh, so there is this core that is absolutely the same. On the other hand, it's a mistake to lose sight of the very different histories of these different uh, elements of our society. Great. That's great. Thank you, Jim. Hey, Demond, since I have the floor, do you mind if I ask another question? Sure, sure, please. Okay, thanks. So um, I posted this one in the chat as well, Jim, and this is getting outside of the accommodation, but what are your thoughts about the concept of critical race theory and more specifically, the impact of teaching about systemic racism in our public schools? Well, uh, I'm, I, you know, I, I have to admit, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't really know what critical race theory is. I, I've tried to look, at, you know, there seem to be all kinds of answers for that. Uh, I don't think there's a, a bulletin board somewhere where I can go and find out what the principles of critical race theory are. I think we're talking about everything that we've been talking about here today, simply teaching why things are the way they are. Uh, I don't, here, here's my experience that, that I found, and the reason this book is coming back out is that you can experiment, we've experimented for 30 years with not teaching it. The, the, the young people who are interested in this book are interested because they weren't taught it. And they're very curious and they're smart and they tend to be better traveled and better educated than people of the same social stratum back when I was their age. And they simply look at the world and they say, this doesn't make sense. We're going to find out why it's like this. So I don't think there's a big future in trying not to teach them, trying to keep them from finding out. Uh, it's simply their instinct to, to learn, and they're going to find their way to it one way or the other. Yeah. Thank you. It, you know, Jim, I want to take another few questions from the audience here, but I want to start with uh, Harsh uh, with the Bank of America. Harsh, I think you had a question there. If you don't mind, could you, uh, you feel free to ask Jim? Yeah, can you, Damon, can you hear me okay? I hear you yes. great. Sound good. Awesome. Sound good. Thank you. And, and Jim, appreciate your time and your insights. And uh, the, the question I posted in my chat, and as I was thinking, uh, as I was writing it, it almost sounded horrible. So I apologize that it's not my intent. But, you know, as I look from my little world, uh, you know, we, we, as, we, as we compare the, the different minorities around the, around the globe, you know, we talk right. and Ken has had a great question about, um, you know, the, the Asian American population, the, the Indian population, et cetera, Hispanic, African American. There, there tends to be statistics that continually demonstrate that the Asian American and the Indian populations tend to even exceed the white population from education and wealth perspectives. Um, yes. So from your research or your observations, are there any trends that, that have helped this one minority group over the others that, that maybe we need to focus more on to, to, to bridge this gap? Well, I think you, you, you sure put your finger on it in the... Uh cultural historical emphasis on education. That works for everybody. And the, the, on the obverse, the other side of it is that education in this country has been a major battleground for racism. So uh, no, African-Americans don't have the same uh, faith in, in educational institutions because in their experience, those institutions have not been welcoming or hospitable to them. They, they've been hostile, hostile ground. Uh, that's changing, and there's a huge effort. And, and, and the exciting thing is that there's such rewards when we go back into schools, public schools, charter schools, all of them, and change that chemistry, then you find uh, uh, this, this great success rate for black kids and Hispanic kids if the schools work for them. Um, it's just a, there again, we're, we're talking about very different 
life experiences, very different histories, different origins, and we are we are created by those those uh, origins. Um, it's it's uh, it's hard to compare. It's hard to do straight up comparisons if you just look at today. That's why I think it's so important to understand the past and where we came from. The other thing, that, the, the piece of the puzzle that's really missing is not black people thinking about what it means to be black, Asians thinking about what it means to be Asian. What's really missing is white people thinking about what white is. That's something, that's a, a piece of work we all need to do. We need to decide what do we think white makes us? What does white do for us? What, 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 what is white when we say we're white? Uh, that's kind of at the center of this and the other things revolve around it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Harch, for that as well. Uh, I want to take another question from uh, Colin. And I'm not sure who you're with, Colin, so forgive me for not knowing the company that you're with, but Colin, are you there? Uh, yes. Um... I'm connected to the Allen uh, Fairview Chamber that invited me to this uh, setting. So I'm grateful to Welcome. be among you. Yes. You want me to ask my question? Yeah, please, please. I I'm curious, uh, you mentioned about the black clergy, W.A. Criswell, and there's plenty of white examples as well, but how, uh, how, are, how would you tell the story today about uh, white churches standing in the way, black churches standing in the way, and how can faith community work alongside uh, the business community uh, to help affect these issues in Dallas in the years ahead? Well, uh, that's a great question. And, and it's one of the ways in which I think the picture has changed so dramatically. Uh, if, you, uh, if you look at, at, at the Baptist school, is it Baptist Academy? At, at first, first Baptist, anyway, you're going to see a pretty diverse student body. If you if you look at the role of organized religion in churches in the in the city now, you'll see a lot of activism around social equity issues, and a lot of activism around social equity. It's sort of self-interested social equity in the corporate community. I learned just this week something I didn't know that there are two or three efforts to set up. Uh, construction trades academies for ex-offenders. And those are corporate, those are business. And in, at a certain point they're profit oriented where you're saying, hey, here's this workforce of people who badly don't wanna go back to prison and yet they have no way to get a good job because they have records. And so we're gonna set up a channel with some of them, not all of them, but some of them can come back into the mainstream. So I, I think today, there's this much more helpful fabric of cooperation between the faith community and the business community than we had back when I was writing the book and certainly much more uh, helpful than we had in the period of the 1950s that I was writing about. Sorry, I was talking to myself on mute. I was the first one to do it today, I guess. The mute uh, monster got me. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, we're approaching uh, the back end. We got uh, five or 10 minutes left, but I, I do want to take a couple more questions. I know we have uh, our former uh, past chair, Bill Siegel with uh, Cowles and Thompson had a question. Bill, please, if you don't mind. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jim, great discussion. I, I'm curious, do you plan on doing a follow-up book uh, in light of the recent legislation attempting to suppress the vote? and of people of color and legislation dealing with the teaching of critical race issues. In one sense, you say things are improving or changing, but are they? And do you anticipate any kind of backlash, if, if any? Oh, so thanks for that question. Great to see you. And, uh, I, I think that, uh, no, I'm not going to write that book, but that book has to be written. Man, are, we're in a, just simply in question of what's on the table now, the stakes, the issues on the table right now, we're in a much more volatile period than the period I was writing from in the 1980s right now. And 
and the jury's out. We don't know how this ends. And I think it would be enormously helpful for somebody to write a book that simply explained what the stakes are and, and tried to uh, go at some of the, the scary, destructive mythology that, that we're hearing out there. But it needs to be somebody younger, uh, probably somebody who doesn't look like me. And I hope that they will be able to do, do a better job than I was of taking on this inner landscape, which again is this question of, okay, if, if we're so divided by race, it, it, the, the, this is a life and death shooting in the street, uh, economic destiny question. Can we talk about what it is? What is race? What do we think race is? Because the scientists tell us there is no such thing. So I, I think there needs to be a new book that both goes at it in that really fundamental way, but also does a better job of explaining what the stakes are today. And I hope that there's room for one that will be local. And I think that's what Will Evans at, at Deep Vellum has in mind, one that will help people get this stuff in terms of our community and our city. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Bill, uh, for that. Um, you know, as we're, we're coming here to the back end, I, I do have a question or two remaining for you, Jim. Uh, really appreciate you being a true sport today. And then also I want to save a little bit of time for you, Jim, to kind of talk to us a little bit about, you know, the plug-in for your book and some of the next steps uh, with that as well. But my, my final question, uh, as I peruse through the chat box to make sure I'm not missing any other questions, um, my final question to you, you know, is what are your, you know, uh, weaker last thoughts, but obviously what would be the three points you would want to point out that could make Dallas a better business environment from a DEI perspective? Well, I, I mean, the first one would be the enormous uh, discrepancy between territory and tax base. I had these numbers in my head. <laughs> Uh, before we sat down, and I can't think of them right now, but there's such a, there, there's this vast area south of 30 that's half or more than half of the, the physical territory of the city and a fraction of the tax base. And so the first point I would try to make is we, we should be looking at that as wonderful opportunity. Um, the second point would be, we know how to do this stuff. If, if, if you look at the, at the school reform movement and uh, work, work done by uh, groups like Todd Williams's Commit and others, you see that we already know how to go into schools and turn kids' entire lives around. Uh, and, and it does not cost more money. It costs the same money, it might cost less. So here's this enormous opportunity sitting there, and we know how to turn it around. We know that it has to be done early and mainly through schools. Uh, th there are metrics for this that are pretty precise and based on decades of research. The kids have got to be reading competent by the end of the third grade and arithmetic competent by the end of the third grade. And then their whole trajectory changes. And we know how to do that. And then, so here's the opportunity sitting there. We have these mechanisms for going and, and making that happen. And then the third thing would be that there are things that we can do right now, right now, without waiting. I think these academies for construction workers are a great example. In those conversations, I had all my life as a reporter with the guys around the barrel fire. I'm telling you, the one thing those guys don't want to do is ever get sent up again, ever go back to prison, ever go back to that life. And yet, they have no way to earn money. And so, except for the bad way, which is right across the street, very tempting. And so if we open 
if, if, if we look at these guys and say, wait a minute, some of them, some of them are bad actors. They're, they're criminals who are looking for the next crime to commit. But most of them are good guys. Some of them are smart, good guys. And they desperately want to have a normal life. And so we can go through things like this construction academy and other things like it. We can just open the door, just open that door and say, come back in here where the rest of us live and get a job and have a life and be a regular guy. So, so there's the opportunity sitting there in front of us. There's all this research and know-how on how to turn things around. And then there are the immediate things that we can do by giving people a chance. Great. Well, fantastic. Well, uh, before I close us out, Jim, uh, and kind of give my appreciation, I would love for you to kind of give us some uh, circle back around to your book. Talk, tell us a little bit how, if we're interested, I know many haven't had an opportunity to read this yet, and I think many of the participants will be eager to. And then I think you talked a little bit about some, you, you do a little bit of a hint out there, maybe of some potential future writings, not from yourself, but uh, maybe yeah. a publishing company. Yes, I, uh, I said at the top, I think that republishing the book was not my idea. I thought it was a weird idea when I first heard about it. I was paid some for the rights to the book, but I'm not getting, this is a nonprofit operation. It's been funded by foundations. I don't get royalties. Uh, nobody does. The other participant in the rights is Dallas County Commissioner John Wiley Price and Kwanzaa Fest, because they, you know, they had owned part of the rights also. But this is a nonprofit enterprise, the book is. Uh, it, it's called The Accommodation. It will be republished in September by Deep Vellum Publishing. It's like Deep Vellum, but with a V, Deep Vellum Publishing. They have a website where you can pre-order it. And uh, I hope, it, and in, in response to your last question about a next book or another book, I believe that Will Evans, who's the guru of Deep Vellum Publishing, very intentionally has in mind a series of books. And this is only sort of the intro. And the others will also address these questions from other perspectives but with a local focus. Great, great. thank you, thank you. Uh, well, Jim, great, great job today. Thank you, we really appreciate you taking the time, being a sport here. Uh, time flies when we're having fun. We've already uh, coached an hour. Uh, thank you to all of our participants for uh, you know putting your questions in and participating today. At this point in time, Tina, I wanna pass it back over to you uh, to take it from there. All right, and Ken, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Is there anything that you want to say in closing? No, the only thing I would say is, Jim, thank you. Thank you very much for committing the time and the energy to participate with us today. You are a true treasurer of this city, and uh, it really means a lot for, for you to be here, particularly providing us a, 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 a lens into your book, The Accommodation. And the only other comment I'd make, I put it in the chat, and Jim, you probably didn't see it, but I, I saw some of your comments are very consistent with those of Brian Stevenson, the author of Just Mercy, when you say that we need to look at things through a different lens, we need to listen, and uh, we need to uh, change the narrative. In, in, in many forms. So uh, that's very consistent with what I heard from you today, Jim. So thank you for that. And you said I was a treasurer of the city, not treasurer, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Right, okay. yeah. yeah. But right. uh, in any event, thank you, Tina. Tina, why don't you uh, close us out? All right, so as, as we close out this session, again, thank you, Jim. Um, you know, one thing that sticks with me that you said is don't be afraid of the history. Uh, I think that's very true. And also we shouldn't be afraid of these kinds of conversations uh, because more of them need to be had. And I think it's, it is the way uh, forward. So when we know better, we do better. Uh, I believe that if you have a growth mindset, 
Um, and so there's a lot we can learn from the past to take, take forward. So like I said at the beginning, this is experiencing DEI as a series. You will hear more from this chamber on our next program that will come up in, in August. One of the ways uh, we may experience this topic is to partner with a group called Project Unity that Richie Butler in, in Dallas has uh, to do something called Together We Dine, um, which would have some facilitated conversations like I'm speaking of. So we hope to put that together, uh, if, if not for our next program, somewhere down the line in the series. Uh, but we're really gonna look to do some things to help kind of immerse all of us in the topic and also just allow us to have the conversations with each other as we continue to improve as business leaders. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, check out North Dallas Chamber of Commerce, uh, ndcc.org for programming information of everything that's happening at this chamber. Lots going on and we're looking forward to, uh, as the world opens up even more, I look forward to uh, hopping off screen at some point and seeing each other in person again. Thank Tina, you. Tina, one more thing. If we could turn it over to Jeff Kittner. Yes. Uh, he has a little bit of a closing comment as well. So Jeff, do you want to take that? Absolutely. Thank you, Ken. And thanks again to Jim and Dumond and Tina and everybody for this outstanding presentation. Jim, uh, as a token of our appreciation, we'll be making a donation in your honor to the Austin Street Center. And I also oh, want to thank, thank you. all of our sponsors of this program. We've got quite a few. AECOM, Dallas College, Market Wave, HDR, Encore, Texas a and Commerce, Coles and Thompson, Jacobs, UT Southwestern, Children's Health, HNTB, Imprimis Group, Polsonelli, Reliant, and Wafed Bank. Thanks to all of you sponsors for helping us put this series on. I see almost all of you are represented here today by somebody, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Visit ndcc.org for some upcoming programs and stay tuned for our August Experiencing DEI series program number two. And we will leave the line open for any networking if anybody would like to stick around and chat in a more informal way. And uh, otherwise, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for concluding. Tina, thank you for your closing remarks. And uh, Demond, uh, wonderful job moderating. But then, of course, the iconic Jim Shoots. Thank you very much for you being here and uh, you sharing, sharing perspectives. Really, really special. Really special.